Prince County Board of Education meeting for uh, March the 3rd, 2021. Um, do I have a motion to go into executive session? Yes, not a, a closed session, not executive, I'm sorry. Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move for the board to meet in a closed session to discuss the performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction and to consult with counsel and to perform an administrative function. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 The motion carries 5-0. We will be back at uh, 6 o'clock for our regular meeting. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to Queen's County School Board. Can we stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, members, you have the agenda in front of you. Do you have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, we have uh, minutes that we have for both February 24th open and executive close. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Uh, Ms. Wright, can you call that by uh, vote? I will. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Mr. Um, Schipanelli? Yes. Yes. Ms. Harper? Abstain. Ms. Bennett? Yes. I have four in affirmative. Motion carries. Okay, we have recognitions. Uh, Dr. Kane, the first. Wonderful. <clears throat> we have recognitions from Manapique Middle School tonight. Uh, board members, if you will stand at least. <laughs> okay. Dr. McCoy to come in, please. <laughs> just, just by myself. Yep, come on in, you get to stay. So our first award tonight is the Spirit Award. And as Dr. McCoy is the principal at Mattis Peak Middle School, she will be present for all of them. A couple of our recognitions um, are not with us tonight. They had to be um, absent because they had previous engagements. But we're going to read their recognition anyway. Our first award goes to Mrs. Stacy Bothmeyer. And this is the Spirit Award. Ms. Stacy Bothmeyer is an invaluable asset to Mattapique Middle School. As the guidance department secretary, she's always welcoming while greeting everyone with her friendly smile. And it's going to be a little bit harder to see now since we have masks on, but you can tell by the corners of the eyes. Um, she has created a warm and inviting environment, making all who enter the guidance suite feel welcome and relaxed. She works hard to build relationships with students, staff, and parents, and is always searching for ways to make connections. Mrs. Bothmeyer engages students students in conversations to help ease their anxiety and frustration while waiting to see the guidance counselor. Students often stop by just to say hi because they know she's genuinely happy to see them. Mrs. Bothmeyer uh, volunteers to help with special schools events, PFY, and even serves as a home hospital instructor uh, provider. She contributes to an overall positive school environment and special events throughout, I'm sorry, by wearing festive holiday attire and participating in special events throughout the school year. She's a huge, she has a huge heart and constantly looks for ways to help others. This year she was instrumental in helping organize and facilitate the weekly backpack program as well as the adopt a stingray program, contributing her own resources to help some of the most needy families during the holidays. We're fortunate, says Dr. McCoy and her team, to have Mrs. Buffmeyer as a cheerleader for the students and the staff at Mattapique Middle School. Congratulations to Mrs. Buffmeyer. And we're gonna give you her certificate to take with you. Thank you. All right. The next award is the Energizer Bunny. 
And that award goes to Mr. Alfonso Sorrell. Mr. Sorrell, come on forward. I, but I got my energizer funny. And you have our team? Yeah, I got oh. our team. Come on, y'all. Come on, 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 come on,
Additionally, we would like to recognize Mr. Gould, who provided summer school instruction to students as well. And we're proud to uh, call Mr. Gould and Mrs. Orsler Mattapique Middle School's teachers who make a difference in the lives of students every single day. Congratulations. And we thank you very, very much. And I'm going to guess give you the Forstlers. I'm going to ask if you would uh, take a picture. Uh, moving on to four board and staff involvement, board members. Um, do we have any discussions that you'd like to bring up what's happened over the last month or anything? Amy? Thank you so much. Uh, on February 10th, I attended the National School Board Association's Equity Online Symposium for 2021 by webinar. A fantastic group of educational leaders from around the United States provided insight on equity and social issues in relation to education and the work of school boards. On February 21st, I attended by phone the Sunday Supper Committee where Mr. Clay Washington was a guest speaker presenting the Queen Anne's County Seven Black History Trailblazers. <coughs> There was a breakout session after Mr. Washington spoke and the moderator asked the group about their thoughts and feelings about these wonderful community members that gave so much to Queen Anne's County. And I really did appreciate it and enjoyed hearing the presentation and the, the discussions. Uh, I am still the liaison with Mabe during the superintendent search. The last day for applications was uh, for the position is March 1st. The members were meeting with uh, Mabe by Zoom March and April to narrow down the applicants. Um, the members wish to thank everyone who participated in the survey. There was almost 400 responses to both times that it went out and 60% of that number were QACPS staff members. Uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'll be attending the JV football team Saturday. Uh, All right. It'll be a home game um, and varsity plays Friday night. Um, I also attended on February 10th the uh, NSBA Equity Online Symposium, um, and it seems so short compared to all that Ms. Tammy accomplished, but I did attend the symposium. It was very good. Yeah, just uh, two or three comments. First one, uh, last week we did uh, become the first county in Maryland to have a public school uh, clay uh, sporting clays team. I wanted to re uh, thank Sean Connolly. Uh, Mr. Connolly's obviously a county resident, and um, he introduced the uh, concept of having the team last March. Uh, and then, of course, the pandemic hit, and it was sort of obviously put on the, the sidelines there. But uh, I commend him because he stuck with it. And as soon as uh, January rolled around, he, he came back, and, and we got it back on the the, uh, the table. I called him. Uh, after last week to thank him and um, actually offer my uh, services as a range officer. And uh, he said he's got lots of volunteers in the community. So uh, shout out to them, anybody who's volunteering, and of course with all of our teams. And um, also I'd like to thank the staff here, um, uh, Ms. Pullen and the whole company that uh, provided all the information and uh, there was a lot of it and, um, and, and made everything happen. So looking forward to having that team uh, come together. Uh, Constitutional Day and Constitution Day and Citizenship Day. That's the second thing. Um, I was looking at the Maryland Education article and I saw that uh, September 17th of each year is designated as Constitutional Day and Citizenship Day. It's des designated by the federal government. And I reached out to Dr. Kane and she indicated that Mr. Tolley, I think. Um, Tolley is supervisor for history, correct. Mr. Tolley, right, has some uh, resources and, and is going to uh, make resources available um, uh, for recognition of that day. Um, the board is actually uh, in accordance with section 7116. Each county board may establish a program of education to be held on that day which can include special assemblies, discussions about the Constitution, and the Maryland Constitution as well. They obviously specifically mentioned that. Um, 
presentations, events commemorating the U.S. Constitution and the Maryland Constitution, and actually create opportunities for eligible students to register to vote on that day as well. Of course, a lot of a lot of them, you know, register with the, uh, through the MVA and that sort of thing. But um, so I would like the board just to over the next couple of weeks think about some ideas how we could make this, um, you know, a day age appropriate for the grades. Uh, any teachers, principals that have input um, would certainly be welcome. I'm not sure how this would look, uh, but I think it's a great opportunity to do two things. One, reinforce our current curriculum. One of the core subjects, as we know, is, is uh, government and civics, and that would certainly go toward reinforcing that. Uh, and the uh, board's other duty obligation of um, instilling uh, patriotism and devotion to the flag, devotion to the country uh, in accordance with section 105. That's one of our obligations. So it would further both of those things. Last, um, the COVID numbers in the county on Monday were 2.94, the positivity rate. The uh, uh, seven day case rate, I think it's called, is 7.94. Recall just a couple of months ago, they were up in the 30s and the positivity rate was at 15 or 20%. It was very high. Today, they're at 3.52 and 7.6 respectively. Um, it's time that we go to a full day hybrid uh, uh, school week. And uh, I'm going to make a motion or I do make a motion that we do start a full day hybrid school week beginning on March 15th. Point of order, Mr. Smith. Mm -hmm. This is about board involvement, not an action item at the moment, and the opening of schools is not on the agenda. Well, it's I'm not. I'm just making a motion. I'm just making it a point of order. Okay, but if a uh, board member, do you have any exception for board member, and it can be, it can be voted on if it gets a second, uh, makes a motion and then we move forward or not forward with it? It is a motion. It's my understanding that a board member can make a motion uh, pretty much any time. If I can get a second. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Call by roll. I have discussion. Sorry. <clears throat> Once again, mm -hmm. we have added something to the agenda during the meeting, which I have known nothing about. I have been told multiple times each time that you do it that you won't do it again, but it continues to happen. Uh, and, and I just want to put that on the record that it continues to happen. It is a complete and total disregard for the superintendent. So I'd like to say that <clears throat> this has been on the agenda and it's a, it's a very hot, not hot issue, it's a very critical issue that needs to be discussed. Um, the numbers are down. A couple weeks ago, I moved to uh, reopen the school's full day hybrid on March 8th. Uh, that obviously did not pass. The numbers were still high then. Uh, they are, I mean, they're about as low as I can, you know, I would reasonably expect them to be. Um, you know, obviously we want it down to zero. But the kids need to get back in school. We've discussed this. It, I don't think it's a shock to anybody that it would be discussed tonight um, or that there's any other information that's needed to make a decision on this other than the numbers. The numbers have been the critical point of issue for the Teachers Association, uh, the vaccines. I know more uh, teachers have been vaccinated. Um, these, these issues have been discussed and discussed and discussed. So the numbers are at where they are right now. It's March 3rd. I'm moving to get them uh, the school's full day hybrid by March 15th. Um, I think it's important to the community that we do this. Unfortunately, it wasn't on the agenda officially, but it's my understanding that a board member can make a motion at any time. And, uh, and, and I would like to see a vote on it. So now that Mr. Chivinelli has spoken to his motion, may I speak now? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a shock to some of us because we did was not aware that this motion was going to be made tonight. And it, as again, it is not an action item. The opening of schools is not on our agenda. And I just feel it's inappropriate to bring it up right now. So. Well, I would, I would like to have input from our board members when I do agenda and I usually get uh, the agenda on there by Thursday or Friday so it's posted for the weekend. It was not on there but I'm also not opposed if Mr. Uh, Nelly wants to make a motion. Um, it has been discussed in the past. It was I think uh, voted down last time and if it has a first and a second we'll have discussion and we can see what happens this time. 
to have what? any other discussion? I think you need to consider, you still have staffing issues, you still have space issues. You can't just strip away the mandates from the governor, MDH, and MSDE. We can't ignore those things. We still have to work within those parameters. Right, so. Schools are not built for six foot spacing to accommodate what you're asking for, especially when we're using common areas. Where are you gonna put those students that don't have a teacher in a classroom? They're using the cafeteria. They're using every available space for those students. Where are you gonna put them? Right, so. A point of order, Mr. Schifanelli. Oh. All the other board members must speak before you speak again. I'm sorry. Your motion, you have spoken to your motion. Okay, let, let, let Michelle finish and then we'll, we'll have Thank to do you. one by one. It, it, I mean, to me, that's the concern. You can't strip away the mandates and the protections to make this happen if you still don't have the staff and the spacing to make it happen, especially if all these agencies are still sticking by the mandate. We can't ignore that. So. Do I? Okay. Any other comments? Helen, anybody else? Uh, well, I just, again, I just want to put power back into the parents' hands and uh, to make the decision of whether they you know, stay virtual or they make this long day. I think it's really challenging for our um, kids and the parents to only go for the few hours. I understand the hardships we're having with, with the staffing. I understand, though, that there have been an awful lot of people who have volunteered to be certificated, to be able to stay in the classrooms or the lunch rooms. Um, certainly, we're not going to go against mandates. Um, I don't know if we have any you know, leeway within just guidelines, suggested guidelines. Um, you know, I think that we do a great job staying safe while we're in the classrooms, um, a couple extra hours. I know it's a hard, I know it's challenging and certainly, um, you know, if there's anything that the board, I know speaking for myself that I can do to help with that, um, I will, but I just believe it's time to get our kids back into full day hybrid as well, as soon as we can as challenging as it's going to be. Um, I have some comments on it, but I also got some other things I want to go on. But this motion's on the table right now. Is there any other comments by staff, or I'm sorry, Dr. Kane or board members? Well, I would like to respond okay. when everybody's done. Well, I mean, do you, want to, uh, do you have any more discussion before I call this to vote? Yes. Well, so, I, would, I would like to hear Dr. Kane's recommendation. Yes, well, I've given my recommendation uh, multiple times. It is going to present a challenge for us uh, for space. It's going to present a challenge for staffing. But if, if that is the will of the board, then we'll do exactly what the board says and, and we'll, we'll just have to suffer the consequences as they come in terms of not following you know spacing rules and that kind of thing. What I will, what I will offer is that parents will, will, will want to um, respect the fact that they may not have their same teacher uh, that is that is probably not possible we still have about 30 percent of our families that uh, continue to be instructed fully virtually and what we have in the afternoons now is time for our teachers to meet with those children um, and offer them some small group instruction that will go away because obviously if teachers are teaching in class face to face all day there will be no time in the afternoon for um, for students who are fully virtual so they will be fully virtual at home all day, you know, during during the day. So, and, and if we can manage, because quite frankly, I've already mentioned that 10% of our teaching staff is not teaching right now. If we can manage um, to have some teachers that are fully virtual, to it just depends on where they are, you know. Um, so perhaps even students may have an opportunity to, to be part of another school. If we don't have, if I have, um, a couple of third grade teachers and enough students, you know, but not at a particular school. Maybe those kids can be taught by a teacher, a third grade teacher at another school. So, you know, there, there are definitely ways that we can manage that. Uh, it will not be school as normal. And so, and teachers will likely not be the same teachers that children have right now in, in some of those cases. But, you know, if it is the will of the board, then that's what we'll do. It, 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 I just, fair warning, it will not look the same. Thank you. Thank Any you. other comments? That's right. Sure. Can, I'm sorry, you got. Yeah, just to respond. So I did take a look at Governor Hogan's uh, updated 
declaration of January, and you know that is a problem when you say something's mandated. They're mandating the guidelines, <clears throat> so they're guidelines, but they're being mandated. So there are ultimately guidelines, which the governor says, it, it, to the extent possible, six foot distancing should be maintained, to the extent possible. At the same time, we're being told, get the kids back in school, because they're failing, you know, we've, we know all the issues that they're, of which they're suffering. So we're extending the day several more hours to go full day hybrid, and they will still maintain their six foot distancing. You're still gonna have families, half the school population is going to be virtual, you know, during that day, half's gonna be in the class. So they'll still be able to maintain their six foot and their plexiglass uh, desks and everything, all those other protocol measures. But the problem is at lunchtime. So the teachers have to have their one half hour duty free lunch. They're gonna have to work around that. So that at that time, if the weather's not nice, they can't go outside, whatever, they're gonna to have to eat lunch in the lunchroom for between 20, 30 minutes, they're gonna be a three foot distancing or whatever. So that's the guideline to respect the six foot to the extent possible. So does that mean we keep the kids out of school, they go to school for two, some of these kids ride the bus for an hour, they're in school for two hours, they're back on the bus for an hour. You know, they spend more time in the bus than they do in school almost. Um, so those are my concerns. Uh, and again, it is, guide, it is guidance, they're just guidelines. And so even the State Board of Education is, is telling us their guidance is to get the kids back in school. So it's conflicting guidelines, we have to make the decision, and I made the motion. Thank you. Any other discussion? Um, Ms. Wright, can you call roll? Yes. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Mr. Smith? No. Ms. Harper? No. Ms. Morissette? No. Mr. Schipanelli? Yes. Motion fails three to uh, two to three. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to, some of that's going to go on my line for the next one. I have my time now. Uh, Dr. Kane and her staff, we met on February the 8th with uh, the county and some of their administration. Went over, one date is April the 6th will be when we're presenting our final budget to the county. Uh, mm -hmm. That was set there, I think, Dr. Kane. Mm -hmm. uh, we went over vaccination uh, status of our staff. I want to thank the county for doing everything he can, but as we know, it's limited to what this county's getting on a, on a weekly basis, but uh, we are going in the right direction. They asked the same question about reopening schools, and also we talked about a little bit about the summer school uh, plans that we have that uh, I would like to put on the um, uh, for next April meeting. Uh, Dr. Kane's been worked on that and gave us some insight on that, and that could be something that's going on. Going back to opening up schools, I think we need to open these schools back up more. We're at a half day now. With two half days, these children are basically getting one day in school per week, which is 20% in classroom. And I agree with Mark that, you know, we're spending a lot of money with transportation. These, these students are on the bus longer, or as long as they are in class. So it, it makes sense when we can to get us back full time for our hybrid days, for the whole day. My understanding is some other counties have been successful in doing this. Um, and I've got some information, I can certainly give it to them. Dr. Kane's got more than me, I'm sure. Carroll, Hartford, Montgomery, Talbot, and Calvert. Um, the emails I'm getting and what I'm hearing from the public is we, they need and they want more in-person students in school. And I think that's where we need to get to in a, in a short time. Um, we need to identify, as Dr. Kane said, personnel shortages and how we can come, overcome that problem. I don't know if there's CARES money for additional staff, uh, PTA character counts get involved and help, and I know there's a lot of pitfalls when you start um, asking for volunteers. Um, but if some other schools have been able to open up on a full day, and I mean, I've just got one right here, Montgomery County, which is very detailed, but I, I, I can't find out how, what they're doing by covering their lunches. I, I've read the whole thing, can't, I don't see you that. You also know that they're not all the, all the grades are not. Well. 
okay, all of them are. And I understand our tiers of buses, um, you know, we're, we're intertwined in this county with that. So there's a lot of challenges that we, that we have, but I would really like to see us try, come up with a plan that we can get back to full days for our hybrid program um, in the short future because these students have been out of school for a year. It's March, and that's when they went out last time. Um, and I just feel strongly that we need to get them back. We're just losing too much ground. And what challenge do we have? I would like you to look into what we can do and come back to this board maybe next week with some ideas of, of, of a, and I know you've worked on this and we've asked this question. I'm not trying to go around circles and ask you 10 times, but whatever this board can do to help you and the school system, tell us. If we can do it, I want to see it done, and I think the board and the county wants to see it done, the, the, the parents. And it's challenging, and but it's a it's a charge I'd like to see us do and, and really move on with it. That would that would be my take on this, um, and I um, would I will put this on the uh, agenda for next. Uh, by the way, it's a work session for next meeting uh, to go over this and try to get an update on why how we can do this i'm not gonna say not why we can't how we can if, if we can that would be my thing and that's that's my two cents on that dr kane thank you so Always, each month, we meet with Pazam, the superintendent's group. Uh, actually, we meet weekly, and on Friday mornings before our Pazam meetings, we meet with the Maryland Health Department and uh, Dr. Chan um, and have those conversations about uh, what's happening across the state. We um, had an, I had an opportunity to be part of the Mayo Conference. I think I mentioned that the last time. That's the Maryland Association for Education Outdoors, Environmental Education Outdoors. And and also, um, we did meet, somebody mentioned that we, Mr. Smith mentioned that we met with the commissioners as we do monthly. Well, it was part of the Sunday supper group last Sunday. Uh, we met with ANS. We continue to have level principals meetings and the high school committee as well. Uh, I was able to represent um, the superintendent's environmental education collaborative for the AASA. That's the superintendent's association across the um, United States um, as a um, coach for the seat I was able to my team and I we met with the joint labor management so the union groups and MSCA rep had an opportunity to serve as keynote speaker for women's conference and on rewriting her story and this is women's history month multicultural advisory committee with Chesapeake College was part of that continue my work with the task force on achieving academic equity and excellence for black boys with the um, state board members and also, we have an upcoming visit from Dr. Salmon, the state superintendent, on March the 18th, and we'll be visiting Queen Anne's County High School, Churchill Elementary School, and Sudlersville Elementary School. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on, student board members, Ms. Smith. Natalie Smith, um, Queen Anne's County High School student member of the board. So what happened in the month of February, we began our A and B hybrid learning schedule, averaging 380 students in the building. Students were recognized for student of the month. Each student received a personalized note from a nominating teacher and a coupon from a local establishment. We also want to give a shout out to our seniors, Journey Wilson and Joel Hoxie, as they were honored at the Chesapeake College's annual Black History Program on February 20th. On February 24th, we had Makeup Picture Day for staff and students. And also during that week, February 22nd through the 26th, it was National Future Farmers of America Week. This is when students were able to show their spirit by participating in different dress up activities. FFA also offered a school wide service learning project. This was a canned food drive benefiting the Centerville United Methodist Church's food bank. Also, five Queen Anne's County High School students auditioned virtually for the Senior All Shore Honors Band. Four out of the five students made a chair placement, so congratulations to them students. For our staff, our academic dean, Tracy Kenna continues to teach her journalism course. Mr. Marchetta, one of our vice principals, 
taught choir for two weeks until a long-term sub could be secured. Ten employees were recognized and celebrated in February. So that's for February. And then upcoming in March, students began competitive sports today, March 3rd, and golf kicked it off with our first event. And our It's Academic team competed virtually and came in second place. And the show will air March 13th. So congratulations to them. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Smith, on the All Shore Band, who all participates? What groups, what counties or schools? I'm not sure. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't know too much information about it. Um, I wasn't given any names of the seniors, which is also unfortunate. But um, I, I guess it's just through competitive um, concert band. Okay. I, I'm almost positive it's concert band, not marching band, because it's like on stage. And Very super cool. cool program. Now, if we wanted to watch It's Academic, where is that airing? Is it Quack TV? Is it, how can we see this on March? Again, oh. I'm not sure. Right. I'm, right. I'm sure it's public broadcasting. Okay. Great. Really familiar right. with its academic team, unfortunately. But <laughs> thank you. They made second place. Yes. 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 Congrats. Right on. The, the band, this level, it's the high school, middle school, and high school both have um, all shore bands that they can try out for. Right, but I wasn't sure what counties, but is it more than all the entire counties? Eastern Shore? Yep. All these nice. So the five counties. That That's were... a very, very cool event to attend. Very nice. Ms. Case. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Alexis Gross, Canalan High School student, member of the board. So in the past month of February, quarter two report cards were emailed out to students on February 5th. Uh, there was a successful distribution of semester two materials on February 5th and 8th. And then on February 13th, fall sports had begun and there was 323 uh, athletes had registered for fall sports. <laughs> Student member or student of the month awards were given out on February 26th, and they were personally delivered by our administration staff again. And then we were finally able to bring in our B Day students on this past Thursday because of all the <laughs> bad weather we've had, and it was a successful return. And then currently and upcoming in March, we have our quarter three interim reports coming out on Friday, March 8th. And then uh, PS PSAT for sophomores is going to be held on March 17th. And then the school SAT day for uh, juniors is on Wednesday, March 24th. Since fall sports are in sessions, our, I know of the first game for football is on Friday, but I'm not sure about all the other ones. It's really exciting for all of my friends that I know on the sports team because they had pitcher day yesterday and it was, it definitely brought spirits back for students, so that was exciting. And then currently we have 60 students registered for spring sports already. And then scheduling for the 2021-2022 school year is still occurring. And then additionally, it was announced that our class of 2021 seniors will have an outdoor graduation on the field on Wednesday, June 2nd. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next item will be citizen participation. Go ahead and read this. Go ahead, yes. <clears throat> okay. We ask all the speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. The speakers should sign their roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of the schools of schools or the board president. If you have a specific question, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and your right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens to show respect for all. Thank you. All right. Uh, do we have the first? Good evening. Good evening. Can you give us your name and address? 
Sure. My name is Cecilia Mitchell. I'm the Vice President of the Queen Anne's County Education Association. I'm here this evening to read a letter from Dr. Um, from Dr. Kane to Dr. Kane and the board members um, from Karen Fields, which I believe has, is being sent to you as well. Um, dear Board of Education members and Dr. Kane, on behalf of the officers, executive committee, and the members of the Queen Anne's County Education Association, we have good news to share for all of those who believe in the mission of public education and want to see it thrive as a vital part of our community. The state legislature overrode the governor's veto of the blueprint, of the blueprint for Maryland's future legislation. This will finally end the underfunding of our schools, provide more funding and support for mental health services, and more career and technical education to prepare our students for better paying jobs. This will also assist with recruitment and retention of the next generation of educators ready to face the challenges in the coming decades. On a more immediate note, QACEA continues to advocate for the health and safety of our students, staff, and the greater community. To that end, we urge that the current CDC guidelines be followed in all buildings. Mask wearing and six feet social distancing be maintained in classrooms and hallways. To assure transparency and trust, we request that a COVID-19 dashboard be posted for every building, which tracks the positive number of COVID-19 cases. This dashboard exists in Howard and Dorchester County school districts. We ask that all documents relating to travel, quarantine requirements, and specific types of testing be consistent across the county. It is vitally important that principals and staff have accurate information to make the appropriate choices for the health and safety of everyone. We want to clearly state that no school building to our knowledge is violating COMAR regulations or the QACEA contract. Any schedule that works if members are asked or encouraged to volunteer for duties that are outside the expressed contractual guaranteed work rules violates the negotiated contract. QACEA continues to meet with Dr. Kane and her team to address workload issues, professional develop need, development needs, and accountability measures that reflect the unprecedented times in which we are teaching and students are learning. Finally, QACEA wants to thank all the dedicated parents, educators, nurses, custodians, instructional assistants, secretaries, bus drivers, administrators, and supervisors that have worked together to support our students. We are stronger together. Sincerely, Karen Fields, President, Queen County Education Association. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. I do it all the time. Do you guys wipe the mics down or no? Oh, I had a mask on for good. Good evening. Nate, your name and address for the record. Richard McNeil, uh, president of the uh, school personnel retirement group. Good evening. Um, I have missed seeing everybody and to the new folks. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. you know, um, just wanted to kind of give an update uh, as to what we've been doing. And even though uh, schools haven't been in session for the last year per se, uh, we, in October, instead of our meeting, we had a drive-through where we collected uh, food material uh, for the backpack program. And um, I think it was, it was published in our newsletter, but we collected enough food from uh, our group to feed children, 40 children, Children for four to five weekends and uh, was really appreciative of the effort of our group to, to do that. In light of that, uh, our meeting in uh, next Tuesday, which would be our normal meeting time, which we're not meeting, we're going to have another uh, drive-through drop-off. Uh, and this time, uh, we're supporting the uh, children that work through the Judy Center. Um, and that'll be uh, between 11 and 1. And with your permission, if I could put this on the bulletin board out here, it's a list of the uh, 
um, items that we're going to be collecting. You can give it to Mrs. Poland so, to take yeah. care of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you. Um, our association uh, now has a Facebook page also to which uh, has allowed us to expand our communication with everything. So in our December, instead of having our December meeting, we had a holiday Christmas house walkthrough virtual. And uh, we had over 22 homes uh, with pictures shown for our different groups. And it was very, brought a lot more of our members together, even from North Carolina and Florida, Tennessee, Tennessee, Texas, California, and Maryland. So it really expanded our way to uh, communicate with them. Um, unfortunately, we've also had 15 retired employees who have passed away in this past year, um, which is the most we've ever had since I've been a part of the organization. And uh, none of them, I don't think because of the COVID, but they just, uh, like me, I'm getting old, you know, and, and that happens. Um, we are in the process of advertising for our uh, scholarship program. Uh, March is the big month for us on that, and uh, we've talked to both high schools, uh, the guidance counselors and the principals about getting that information on the line along with everything else. And uh, we are encouraging uh, any students who would be going into uh, the field of education to consider applying for that. And uh, we, we would like to have uh, um, some applications to, to say put it in a, in a mild way. Um, I'd like to give a quick shout out to all the teachers and the staffs who have been working so hard. Um, I can't imagine what it's been like for them in the past year uh, to run classes on a computer uh, from home or from wherever, uh, and from the and for the parents who have really pushed their children to uh, participate in that. Uh, I know you're back in school in a hybrid situation and uh, I hope that's going well. Um, personally, my daughter who teaches out in Colorado is uh, in an elementary school. Uh, she's gone to quarantine now for uh, four different times because different groups have come in and somebody in there until the whole grade level has had to um, go out. Uh, last thing on my list, I'd just like to say thank you in the budget system uh, to keep our um, health package going um, and we, we greatly appreciate that. Uh, if you're in the area next Tuesday at uh, the high school, Queen Anne's High School uh, between 11 and 1, uh, if you come out you'll see some of us uh, picking up uh, little goodies for uh, the children up there. Uh, thank you very much for everything that you do and um, we'll hopefully see you uh, later on. And uh, Support the sports. The kids are excited. Um, we have some in my community that play football and, and soccer, and um, just to see the the enjoyment on their faces, I think is is going to be worth it. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a ticket, so I can't go. So I'm going to work on that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, you very much. Do I wipe this or yes, please? please. Mm -hmm. In another two years, we won't know what we're doing. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good evening. Can you give us your name and address for the record? Sure. My name is Ashley Gick. I'm now a substitute teacher. Um, 510 Roman Coke Road, Stevensville, Maryland, 21666. You ready? Okay. Good, okay. Good, good evening, place. Dr. Kane and board members. On Monday, I decided it was time to recruit some volunteers who are prepared to pay their $62 for their background check and serve as lunch monitors throughout the county. 
My hope is that this effort will be a part of the solution to the reported shortage of lunch coverage, which is the main reason our children are not in school full days. In just 48 hours on one social media outlet, I have gained 30 volunteers. This was not my job to do, but our children are suffering and I cannot sit back and listen to any more excuses. Please take a, please look in your emails at your uh, time tomorrow and you will see the list of 30 Queen Anne's County citizens and their emails with a couple of phone numbers looking to be reached out to to help our kids. Imagine how many volunteers we can recruit if we spread the word to the entire Queen Anne's County community on an official public platform. I did 30 in two days on Facebook. Currently, there is a 334% increase in mental health crisis for kids under 18. Kids are cutting themselves, self-medicating, and bringing themselves to an early, inexcusable death. It is public knowledge kids are failing throughout our schools, and young children are learning to operate a computer before they can print their name. I saw this on Monday as I taught in first grade. Students, teachers, principals, and school staff and Queen Anne's County citizens deserve so much better than what we have put into action. Two half days of school does not give children or teachers what they need to succeed. It is making the jobs of many hardworking teachers, administrators, and parents even harder. Over the past two weeks, I have learned that the report sent to the Maryland State Department of Education from Queen Anne's County was not reflective of what is currently occurring in our schools. MSDE was under the impression from said report that all children were in school for half days a week. As a community, we all know this is not what's happening in all schools for all children. This has had my stomach in knots. I feel physically ill knowing this confusion exists. The MSDE has made Queen Anne's County aware of this finding and is requesting um, a report to be submitted that reflects an accurate description of what is occurring in our schools right now. Plans are being reviewed and those school systems that are not reflecting two days of instruction for students will be provided feedback by MSDE. It is my sincere hope that leadership diligently takes on the task and clears up all misunderstandings and keep the public informed. Senior leadership should be taking the burden of creating full day plans off of each, of each school and their principals. Full day school plans should be standard, put into action by our leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. Moving on to number six, uh, Dr. Kane, get your calendar. Okay. okay. Come on forward, please, if you would, Mrs. Forbes. Mrs. Forbes has gone back at the request of the board um, to put the calendars out again for public viewing. And in, a, in the meantime, we have gotten some feedback from a parent, and, and I tasked uh, the team with going back to make a third version of the calendar reflecting the comments from the parent who gave some feedback. Thank you, sir. Um, so Mrs. Forbes and Mrs. Bass who sit on the calendar committee. Thank you. Thanks. It's been a pleasure working with um, Mrs. Forbes. We have taken everything under consideration several times, parental comments, board members' comments, and I think you might be pleasantly surprised at the creativity of the people on the committee. Sure. So good evening, President Smith, Dr. Kane, members of the school board and executive team. Again, for the record, my name is Julie Forbes. I am the supervisor of accountability, assessment, and data management. So as Mrs. Bass mentioned, on February 3rd, we presented two versions of the 2021-22 calendar to the school board. And following that, they were posted for public comment on the uh, district website. And so we continued to monitor that feedback. Some feedback was sent directly to members of the board who shared that with us. And the calendar committee reconvened on February 24th and reviewed all of the feedback. At that point, we had received 17 comments to the website. Um, and in addition to that other feedback we received from our school board. And at that point, we had three people who indicated version one was their preference. We had seven who indicated version two was their preference. And we also had five people who 
mentioned the idea of including a full spring break, which also corresponded to the feedback that we received from other members of the community, other parents. Other considerations that were brought to us um, was that there was a slight error on the version one. Um, that April 11th on version one should be reflected as a half day. It was for all students because that's the end of the third quarter. So I made that adjustment on the version you can see now. Um, another person commented upon the importance of the number of instructional days before AP testing. And there were also just comments about really trying to look at creative use of our professional development days for our staff so that those can extend weekends for students. Because as we know in professional development days, students don't attend while teachers um, attend professional development. So we took that feedback, we met as a committee, um, and came up with version three. And so we posted version three to the website on February 26th, and we really wanted to make sure that the public knew it was there since we added another version. So we made sure to um, put some Something on social media on the district Facebook page to make sure just to give extra attention. And since then, uh, we received 21 additional comments. So after February 26th, when we posted it, and of those 21 comments, 18 people stated their preference for version three, three for the first version. Um, and so now I'll just go through and review the calendar. So again, um, I'm gonna to briefly touch upon one and two, just for members of the community who maybe did not hear our presentation before um, on February 3rd. So this was version one. Um, all of the calendars reflect a early dismissal day on Friday, September 3rd, which um, was to accommodate feedback we had received prior to, just with traffic and getting into the long weekend that that was preferable for families. Um, you can see the, the various breaks through the year. The professional development days are those solid days in green. We are required to have a certain number of professional development days. Those are in the contract with our teachers. And then you can see the winter break. Uh, these two red days here are the end of the semester, and those go into two professional development days, and then semester two starts for our secondary students. Coming into April, um, on all versions of the calendar, we did add one additional day to the traditional spring break, which is typically the Friday before Easter and the Monday after, and we added that Thursday again, and this was based on feedback we received last spring from families asking, again, for more time um, for students to have with their families. And then you can see on this version of the calendar, with the three inclement snow days, um, that last day worked out to be June 9th, um, and without those days, it would be Monday, June 6th. Version two, pretty similar. Um, there was one additional day built in here to allow students a four-day weekend and also a holiday for staff. It coincides with the MSCA convention. I don't know if that's happening again, but it was feedback we had received last spring, so we made sure to incorporate that. You can see again the winter break, the end of the semester here, the finals um, for high school on the January 27th and 28th. They're always followed, so and our final exams are always followed by two professional development days, which helps our high schools also with the transition to the new semester, because we do have schedule, uh, the majority of our courses are a semester long. So it's really important, it's also nice for students to have that time. And again, that same Thursday here built in in April, um, that brought us to Monday, June 13th. So again, that's a review of what we covered last month. And then we go to version three, which took all of the feedback, um, again, from various stakeholders, and then made the third version. So again, here's our start of the school year. And as a reminder, um, last spring we adopted a calendar policy and regulation which essentially put a, like a formula together, you could say based on the date of Labor Day. So when Labor Day is later, school starts before Labor Day. When Labor Day is earlier, it starts after. And so that's actually written into the regulation that was passed um, last spring, which explains why we're gonna start before Labor Day here, because Labor Day is on Monday the 6th. That did come up with some questions from the public, so just wanted to address that. And so what we were able to do, um, because of the way the quarters worked out, so one of the first things you'll notice is that on Friday, October 29th, we were able to make that the end of the quarter, which is always an early dismissal day. And then the nice thing about that is it leads into a long weekend for students, and they have Monday, November 1st off. So there we built in our professional development day. 
also were able to take feedback from the public to extend that weekend for students. Um, and then continuing on, um, going into those conference days, the Thanksgiving break, the winter break would start on Thursday, December 23rd. And in this calendar, based on the feedback we received on AP, we intentionally um, balanced the calendar so that 90 instructional days fall into September, I mean, into semester one, 93 fall into semester two, and that's to give an, the, the few additional days for the second semester AP students. And again, that was based on that feedback we received it's also more likely but not guaranteed that the inclement weather days will most likely um, be used in the second semester never guarantee with weather but you know we can use our best prediction so that's why we built that and again that was with feedback from the high schools so our semester here ends on Wednesday the 19th Thursday the 20th we have our final exams and again, students go into this nice four-day weekend, have that transition. Um, again, we were able to build it onto the weekends and then start the second semester. And then where the calendar really looks um, yeah, different from years past, and again, based on the parent feedback we received, we built in that full week of spring break. So we are required to have the Friday and Monday Friday before Easter, Monday after um, as holidays. And so we did build in that spring break based on that feedback. And so continuing, and I can tell you, um, just because one of the things I do oversee is testing, so something that immediately popped up into my mind was, oh, well, we have state testing. So I did look at the state testing calendar for 2022, and three of the days out of the six are actually days we cannot test due to holidays. So it's actually only three days. Um, it's not six days out of state testing. So just wanted to mention that. Um, and this version also allows, here 48 I think it's 62 instructional days before AP testing and just for context I believe this year we had 61 so it even kind of builds in an extra day because we started the semester earlier and then it allows us to conclude the year if we had to use those three inclement weather days by Tuesday June 14th if we did not the last day would be Thursday the 9th so did want to put that out there um, and again, the feedback we received on the website you know, has been positive about that third version that incorporated all of that parent and family feedback. Um, so. Can I take any questions? I think I, I, I'm missing a lot something. of work. On the green, it says mm -hmm. teacher professional day. Mm -hmm. Is that a day that the teachers are in, in learning, in service, so they're not teaching that day? That's right. Mm -hmm. And then I see a line through it, it says early dismissal. Yes. It's to children come oh. half day. Huh? The children will come half day and professional develop. The children will come half day and professional development the other half a day. So you see the teachers and you see the children, students. So the teacher on those days are only doing a professional development day for a half a day? Yes. Right. That's mm -hmm. half day. So that's, mm -hmm. we're doing half day professional development rather than a whole day. So, and sometimes. There, there's a combination. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gotcha. the teacher mm -hmm. contract includes nine professional development days. Mm -hmm. Five of those happen before the first day of school. The other ones are are embedded throughout the year and then those green early dismissal days and those those happen on intentional days so it's typically at the end of the quarter so sometimes teachers are preparing for conferences with with families um, sometimes it's grading but it's typically those kind of things on those early dismissal days and that works out for you dr kane as far as professional development half days is just as that's absolutely it's, it's not different from what we've been doing okay mm -hmm. Ask a question. I, I, I mean, I remember uh, when my children were in school that we used to have long um, spring breaks. Um, I'm only just asking that it, with the reasoning of giving it two weeks before AP exams. I mean, that's critical for those students. And if we took out those four days of spring break, it would be four days earlier that the school year would end. Mm -hmm. That's my only mm -hmm. bringing up about having that extra four days of a spring break. I mean, I, I, the AP testing is crucial for some of these seniors, juniors and seniors, so mm -hmm. just brought that up. Yep, and that's absolutely something to consider. Um, when you add the spring break, it certainly affects that last day of school and, the, and those days before um, AP. And again, I'll just, um, 
share for context. So um, there's, if you count the days, the instructional days in semester two, so you do have 62 instructional days that fall before, because AP testing is typically the first two weeks of May. Um, this year we had 61 with the way the calendar worked out. So we, we attempted to address that by, again, putting those inclement weather days in the second semester, but it is absolutely an issue that needs to be considered. Because um, I think there's, no, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to every calendar. And so I think it's what, what works best for, for everyone in the community. So Ms. Harper, your question, if, if on the block of days in April, then maybe shorten that up some? Even if we shorten it by three days, gave them the Monday, Tuesday, Monday, the, the Friday, Monday, and Tuesday, that's three days that go towards the ends of the year, which it would, it would then be, instead of getting out the 14th, you'd be getting out around the 8th. I mean, it's just, I just bring it up only because of AP testing. I know how crucial that is. You say, so go, so take 20, 21, and 22 of April and make that school. Well, if it works with. If it works, right. Well, and, and I think you could say, even on the other versions of the calendar, we, we had attempted to do that initially, and we did add um, that Thursday. Because like this year, um, it's the Friday and Monday off, so we did add that in on the version one and two. So do wanna. So do Thursday, oh. Friday, Monday. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, and then the feedback we received from these versions um, from the community was to look also at the full. A full week. Mm -hmm. Any other members have any opinion or Dr. Kane? Because you see on version one, you get their, their last day is June 9th, rather than, you know, the next week. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Well, if uh, we want to amend this, because it is an action thing for later on in the agenda. Okay. Um, no, but I mean, we need to discuss this and have in information if we're going to change this from one of these to uh, you shorten the spring break. I just think there were, I mean, that was the most comments that they received. Um, and if that's what the parents are looking for and we're still meeting it, all of our mandates and we're meeting all of our obligations, um, I think we should go with what the majority of the comments requested. But, but it is it is giving us going out in June, you know, three half days at the end of third, I'm sorry, the 10th, 13th, and 14th, which going into a Monday and a Tuesday, to get not to, not to go that Monday and Tuesday has some merit too, to try to end by the 9th or 10th. But if you don't use your days, you're still getting out on the night. If we don't use the snow days that are incorporated, yes, yeah. we would be pulling it back. Right. But we can't, I mean, can't, we don't know. Can't count on that. Mm -hmm. And I do know something someone had commented on. Um, one of the comments that arose was someone said they noted that in the event you had a year that had, if you exceeded the number of inclement weather days, you could potentially go back to that spring break and adjust it as well um, mid-year if you had a year for whatever reason. Um, but that was a comment we received on the website too. Yeah, we can, mm -hmm. but people make plans too. And, Absolutely. And that's what concerns me, both teachers, mm -hmm. staff, and parents. Yeah. Once they see this, they make plans around it and then we change it in March because of inclement weather mm -hmm. um, that can be a I mean that, that's a two-edged sword it's good to have that ability but it's also um, you know, it, it's, it, it affects a lot of people too or could affect people if I recall we several years ago we had uh, a week or so of snow days in January mm -hmm. we had voted to have the schools be open on President's Day mm -hmm. We went ahead and passed that. It snowed on President's Day, so they didn't go to school anyway. <laughs> so, um, and then everything had to be made up at the end anyway. So, and it I, just happens. And parents are, they're scheduling those vacations regardless. Yeah. I mean, a lot of families are gonna, they're gonna take that full week if it's a family Easter thing or regardless of which calendar we use. And if I could say, living in substitute land, they do make those plans. Those teachers make those plans because they have personal days they can use. And it is an outcry. I think one of the comments said, 
regardless, they're going to take their kid out anyway. When they're in K through 8, the attendance does not matter. So what they do is have their children go, don't be out. So when it comes time for Easter, and that's usually when that's the fun time, um, not so much Christmas, they're going to write the excuse note to the assistant principal to go to the principal that will exceed the amount of four days they can be out to pass. So it was an outcry. It was really about spring break. So that's why we gave you version three. I mean, there's... <laughs> There's no perfect one because there's, you know, 180 days, 189 days, mm -hmm. uh, certain mandated holidays. Um, you don't want to start too early. You don't want to end too late. You got things to do in the middle. This is one of the longest spring breaks that we've, yes. been, that this uh, calendar committee has proposed in a very, very long time. Well, one thing I can th think of, we need students next year in school is every day we can get them because we haven't been in school for a while. That's just all, but I mean, okay. so I think, you know, what's the best way, you know, I don't, people have to be responsible, but they're supposed to be in school, they're supposed to be in school. And if, if it's a scheduled school day, staff is supposed to be there. I know everybody wants to take off, but you know, we have Christmas holiday and other holidays that, you know, he's got to work. I mean, the, we're mandated by do so many things, so there's no, no silver bullet on this. Well, after February and March being such long months with no break other than uh, President's Day, April looks like a, a blessing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I have no problem with number three at all. Any other board comments? Any questions for staff right now? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be uh, 606 operation, operating and capital budget, Dr. Kane. For the record, Andrea Kane, Superintendent of Schools, and I have with me my the members of my executive team, our CFO, Mrs. Jane Towers, and our interim COO, Carla Pullen. Ms. Bass is here, <laughs> back there in the event we need her for questions. Director for Human Resources. To begin, I'd like to thank the board uh, for meeting with my team over the past several weeks or months in actual actuality in an effort to better understand the needs of our school system. The purpose of today's presentation, thank you, is to provide information on our district's revenues and expense patterns over a period of time, maintenance, maintenance of effort and per pupil spending. Then I'll share my FY22 budget request. To begin, in an effort to ensure alignment of our budget with our district goals and priorities, we've once again aligned our requests with the district five-year strategic plan. Queen Anne's County Public Schools has set a priority that students will meet or exceed standards and graduate on time, college career, and civic ready to be globally competitive. Additionally, achievement disparities among all groups of students will be eliminated. So first, let me share some important data points and accomplishments for the school system. Some of the points I'll mention may sound familiar and some may be new um, for, your, for our listening audience. We have some great things to celebrate. We also have some areas that require more attention and growth. And in the case, case of the latter, we certainly are working to create or implement plans for improvement and apply high yield strategies to garner positive results that benefit all of our students. 
The most important factor in the success of students is having a highly trained teacher facilitating learning in every classroom every day. Offering competitive salaries and a highly engaged supportive community with ample resources is critical to attracting and retaining excellent teachers, administrators, and other school employees. Our starting teacher salaries are competitive with other Eastern Shore districts among new teachers who hold a bachelor's degree starting just at just over 47, almost 48,000, and those with a master's degree starting at slightly above that. There are over 50,000 residents in Queen Anne's County, the sixth wealthiest county in the state, with over 86.7% of households having access to the internet. And of course, we cannot forget that Queen Anne's County Public Schools is the largest employer in the county, providing resources and revenue back to our county in the form of well-prepared human capital, ready to work, support economic development, and give back to the community. There is no better return on our investment. Now let me share some more of the great things that are happening in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Absolutely this year we celebrate Bayside Elementary School. It was one of six new Maryland Blue Ribbon Schools. Uh, Governor Hogan and Dr. Karen Salmon announced that uh, in December 10th, December 10th, 2020 in Annapolis. Bayside Elementary is the first Maryland Blue Ribbon School in Queen Anne's County in over 20 years. In addition, Bayside has subsequently been distinguished as a national Blue Ribbon School, the first ever in Queen Anne's County Public Schools history. For, the, for multiple years in a row, Queen Anne's County Public Schools is leading the state with one of the highest graduation rates, currently sitting at 96.45%. This year, we, we were honored to receive a Governor's Environmental Education Citation. All 14 schools are certified green schools. This is the first time this has happened in Queen Anne's County Public Schools history, and it's only the second district in the state to earn that recognition. arts. We could go on and on and on and on about our fine arts and all of the distinctions that they have earned. I have listed just a few of them. First place in state, I voted art sticker contest winner out of 28,000 votes. All state winners and band at both high schools and all state and dance at Ken Island High School. First ever National Art Honor Society and National Honor Society for Dance chapters established at both high schools. 45 Queen Anne's County Public Schools students earned all shore band recognition. Queen Anne's County Public Schools earned 2020 Best Communities for Music Education Award, national honors out of 754 school districts selected nationwide and one of just six districts in Maryland. Supervisor Michael Bell and lead visual arts teacher at Queen Anne's County High School, Stephanie Zeiler, were recognized as Maryland State Arts Leaders of the Month by Maryland State Department of Education. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that last year we graduated our first 2D and 3D art and design AP advanced placement students in Queen Anne's County history. In addition, Queen Anne's County Public Schools Library Media Specialist swept the state in 2021 Conflict Resolution Day Bookmark Arts Awards. And World Language Teachers helped students at both high schools earn the most prestigious Maryland Seal of Biliteracy for the second year in a row. As we've reported in the past, Queen Anne's County Public Schools has partnered with Bus Patrol and the Office of the Sheriff to put stop arm cameras on all 112 school buses. The intent is to increase safety for our students as they get on and off of the school bus. Next, I'll talk about budget development. First, the timeline. Our budget discussions begin and planning begins at the central office level between July and September. So as soon as we have an adopted budget, we start having conversations. In the early fall, we focus on gathering budget requests from schools and central office departments. In January, we reported feedback from the public regarding budget priorities by way of our budget survey. For FY22, we had 1,345 respondents. The prior year, we had 436 and the year year before that we had 284 so consistently more people are responding to the budget survey. 
Between December and February, we work with our school board to narrow and prioritize budget requests from schools and central office, holding budget work sessions weekly. In March, obviously, I am here to present budget requests to our school board. And in April, I'll present the board approved budget to the county commissioners. Certainly by June, the board must adopt the budget for FY22. In crafting the budget, I think it's important for you and our public to know that as superintendent, I'm required by law to prepare and present an annual budget, seeking every way to secure adequate front funds from local authorities for the support and development of the public schools in our county. This slide summarizes the budget survey. Um, and again, we had 1,345 to respond this year. Uh, community members, employees, business partners responded. Uh, and the priorities are ranked in order. High levels of achievement, graduating college and career ready was number one. Competitive salaries to attract and maintain high quality teachers and staff was two place was small class sizes, obviously low student to teacher ratios. And of course, the next priority was safety and PPE supplies. For the next few slides, I'll talk about revenues. As you can see, most of our funding comes from county and state sources. Any federal money we receive is restricted for certain purposes, such as Title I and IDEA for special education. This year, we, were also, received, we also received funding from the state to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19, and we anticipate state funding to support summer programs for students across all grade levels. For the FY21 um, budget by object, we spent 86% of each dollar in our operating budget toward salaries and benefits. So we have very, very little flexibility with other dollars. We always report on the wealth per pupil. Queen Anne's County is sixth wealthiest in the state of Maryland, and our wealth per pupil continues to increase. However, we consistently fall among the lowest in the state in per pupil spending. A little bit about maintenance of effort. Of course, maintenance of effort is a funding level imposed on counties by state law. The law requires county governments to provide as much funding as they did in the prior year on a per pupil basis. For several years within the last decade, Queen Anne's County was funded at the minimum level required by maintenance of effort law. And for FY22 calculations, Queen Anne's County had the second highest increase in wealth per pupil across the state at 8.1%. Maintenance of effort does include education effort, so I just want to be clear about a couple things. Education effort is determined by evaluating three factors. The lesser of the county's increase in local wealth per pupil, the statewide average increase in local wealth per pupil, or a flat 2.5%. It was determined that because our local wealth per pupil growth was 8.1% and the statewide growth was 5.5%, the state imposed the minimum per law of 2.5% for per pupil allocation. You've heard me say before, and I will state again, that education effort is maintenance of effort. There is no other interpretation. Education effort is MOE and required by state law, not an additional amount allocated over MOE. So in 2021, our per pupil allocation was about 8,100 per student. And for 2022, we estimate it to be just over 8,300. And that's based on our current enrollment, or right. based on that, last year's enrollment? Yes, last year projected for FY22. So let's take a look at our requests. Uh, first, we'll talk about our revenue, our budgeted revenues for FY21 and the estimated revenues for FY22 are shown here, along with the requested increase for FY22 highlighted in the middle column. As you can see, we're requesting 1.8, almost 1.9 million for FY22 for a total budget of 107,524,514.
As I mentioned earlier, this budget is aligned with the district's five-year strategic plan. The district's five progress indicators are drivers for this budget request. From this illustration, you can see the indicators for the five-year strategic plan goals. They are, one, learning accountability and results. Two, safety and security. Three, operational effectiveness. Four, human capital. And five, community partnerships and engagement. Let's start with goal one. The next six slides contain our budget requests as they align with our five strategic plan goals. And to the far left, you'll see how we prioritize the request. M represents a mandatory expense. CB will represent the cost of doing business. And where you see PC, that represents program continuation. And PE will represent a program enhancement or a new initiative. Strategic goal one is learning accountability and results. It includes a full-time instructional assistant for Centerville Elementary School, a gateway teacher, a gateway to technology teacher for Sudlersville Middle School, professional development for grades four and five in the area of math, licenses for discovery education, that's tech books for social studies. Uh, so this is for grades six through eight. They are currently included in our curriculum, but they are consumable, so we have to replace them annually. There are also licenses for Adobe Creative Cloud for CTE courses. Under goal two, that's safety and security. We generally include requests for safety and security in the capital budget, um, and you know we get funds from grants and the things that, for the things that we need. But there is one request this year that falls under this category for the operating budget, and that is a drug and alcohol instructor uh, for our um, life skills training program. As you know, we we usually have that position in our budget. We always ask, but this year we did it because we knew we were virtual for a good part of the year and that program requires some face-to-face -face, hands-on type of instruction so we are asking to put that back in the budget for FY 22 it's associated with the heroin and opioid act we partner with the opioid drug committee and the sheriff's office to do those skills those lessons with our, our middle school students Operational effectiveness, um, this is strategic plan goal three. The transportation bus contracts were 133, almost 134, well, 133,000. Uh, Shredding containers, services uh, for all buildings, travel tracker and athletic trips for students. And we are in the third year of our uh, contract, I believe, for our bus contractors. Continuing with uh, strategic goal three, we also have for operating effectiveness, technology, software, and license increases. Under goal four for human capital, our request is for compensation. Um, it includes a placeholder, as we've talked before, for compensation at 2.7 million. And we, uh, once again, have not finalized bargaining with any of the employee groups, but this is a placeholder which would represent one step and 1% COLA for all employee groups. This also includes a 2% increase for employees at the top of their pay scale. So that's 2.7 million for compensation. And there's also 32,000 there to cover the increase in minimum wage, which is gonna be required by law. There are no requests for goal five under community partnerships and engagement. So last week we shared with you six different scenarios um, and we are recommending today, my recommendation is for scenario two. The scenario includes a projected allocation from the county of 62.2 million, the 32.6 million from state aid, 3.7 million in state blueprint funds, 450,000 from other state sources, 440,000 from other funding such as tuition and building use, and we would use 650,000 from fund balance for a total operating budget of just over 107.5 million. Now our projected expenditures include a variety of factors that will increase our operating budget over FY21s. Those factors include 
the scenario, the, of course, I just mentioned to you the salary increases, the compensation, both one step, 1% 1 and 2% uh, increase for employees at the top of the scale. It also includes a budget request from schools at 253,000, the hourly wage adjustment for minimum wage at 32,000 that I just mentioned before, and projected transportation increase at 133,384. So for so those potential factors, we're talking about an increase of 3.1, just over 3.1 million. We also have to consider um, that we are looking at some other factors and those are the reduction of two positions. One is vacant, one is not. And estimated savings from nine potential retirements totaling almost 314,000. After we add back the 270,000 from the furlough day that we had this year and the 284,617 from the variance reports that Mrs. Towers walked us through a few weeks ago, we'll add back a total of $554,617. We'd also request to use 1.5 million from the nearly 12 million that's currently sitting in the healthcare trust fund. This scenario accounts for projected revenues of just over 107.5 million. It allows us to balance our budget with a compensation package for employees and minimal staffing reductions. Next, I'm gonna share my recommendation for the FY22 capital budget. And you should refer to the capital budget requests that were provided by Mrs. Pullen a couple of weeks ago. It looked like this one, okay? Because I won't go through in great detail um, each one of the items. So we'll start with the capital budget. Now there's $13 million, $13.1 million here, and I'm gonna explain about that in just a second. But for first, the capital state um, fund match for Kennard Elementary, this partial roof replacement is here. And that continues with county funded projects. Now this is the slide that reflects $3 million for the planning and design of a new central office building per the request of county commissioners last year. It also includes just shy of 3 million for repairs to central office. Now I am not requesting both. My team and I thought it was important to request both, to, to add both on this document in the event that if one project was not funded, the other project would still be considered. So that's why you see both of them there, but clearly both of them would not be um, requested. Um, and so the true request totals $10.1 million, not 13.1. We're also requesting 150,000 for health suite expansions for Graysonville and for Kennard Elementary Schools. We'll continue with the capital budget facility assessment related items, and those are for building services, built building shell, windows, gutters, downspouts, interior painting and tile, site work such as sidewalks and asphalt, and substructure repairs. For athletics, we're asking for 415,000. Classroom technology replacements at 70,000. Custodial equipment at 100,000. Fleet vehicle replacements of 267,000. Food service equipment replacements for 417.5. And re furniture replacements, which are direly needed in the classrooms and cafeterias for 380,000. In addition, we're asking for maintenance equipment replacements for 63.5, miscellaneous projects for 69,200, PA intercom replacements for 140,000, phone system replacements for 120,000, playground equipment for 472,000, portables that's not new, but upgrades and repairs to portables that we have for 62,000, and some security upgrades for 193,000. We discussed this before. We own all our portables. That now. is correct. Mm -hmm. And finally, we're requesting 107.5 for buses and equipment, the 1.3, almost 1.5 for the technology. We're in year three of our technology plan. Yes, we are in year three. And also 500,000 for textbooks. 
And again, all of that is 13.1, but obviously we'd be looking at either planning and design for central office or repairs, bringing it down to 10.1. I am asking, and my team is asking, for full funding for this budget. Without full funding, we'll be unable to access those hold harmless funds. That's for the low enrollment that would be, we'd be awarded $3 million if we don't meet MOE plus a dollar. Um, and we'd have the inability to fund compensation increases and maintain competitive salaries for our employees. We certainly have to reduce staff. Last year, we reduced 19 positions. We have the potential minimum wage non-compliance if we are unable to do that for 32,000. We would certainly be increasing our deferred maintenance because every year we put it off, it continues to increase. It doesn't just go away, including safety and security updates. Safety concerns are abounding for furniture that's in disrepair in our schools. Our schools are working on with furniture that's over 30 years and some in its original from when the building was um, built. And finally, continued underfunding of key services in the area of special education and transportation. Those are generally the big ones that we, that we struggle with. And of course, certainly let's consider that we really are in this together. Everybody uses the term unprecedented to describe what the schools and the students and families have been through over this past year in our communities in general. And together, we've watched our students persevere. They've adapted to changes. We have no idea what the future holds, what, how we're gonna start school or how, how things are gonna turn out. We, are, we remain hopeful. And of course, when it's safe for students to return normally all of them every day, then that's together, we'll make that happen. Uh, but what we are asking for is full funding so that we can compensate our employees, reduce the number of uh, staff positions that we have to cut and, um, and be prepared for the year to come. At this point, I'd like to open it up for questions. Board, have any questions or comments? Couple, couple I have. Um, on page 32 or 31, I'm sorry, when we talk about scenario number two, two things we're using, 650 in a fund balance and 1.5 in ASMEC Healthcare Trust. How long would that be sustainable if we, I mean, because you know, we're taking one-time money to a reoccurring cost to balance this budget. When will it be a day that it's no return, you know, I mean, it, to me, not good practice is use one-time money for reoccurring costs. We did that last year, and I think we're coming back with this year that we used 250 last year, now we're, now we're looking at 650. Personally, I think we're heading in the wrong direction doing that. I know we have issues to address, um, but how long would that be sustainable if we keep doing this? Um, for last year, it was budgeted at 250000 We ended up not having to, to use that. In fact, we actually got 1.4 in addition to our fund balance to bring it over the $2 million mark. Um, you're absolutely right. Sustainability is, is um, going to be an issue. We're asking this to bridge to see where we are on the 930 count. This is unprecedented times. As last year was stated that 19 positions were um, eliminated or, or Reduced. reduced. Mm -hmm. And I would hate to see us reduce now and then our counts be back to what we're used to seeing pre COVID and then having to recruit after the school year starts. So this is unprecedented times. Um, and that's why the consideration to use the reserves, that's what the reserves are there for. There's one time un, unknown instances that will ha would happen. Oh. If, if we look at 930 and enrollments up, we can definitely adjust the, the ESMEC Healthcare Trust reserves on what we pull from that year. But my understanding is hopefully, as long as we're a dollar over maintenance of effort, the state's gonna match us a $3 million that's called harm homeless grant. Mm -hmm. And I've asked ho harm homeless grant. Grant to me, is that a reoccurring grant or is that a one year grant? 
it's it's a, it's a one year. Well, then what are we, how are we going to get that $3 million back next year? Well, it, hopefully we'll get it back instead of under the state blueprint fund on restricted line, it'll go back up in that state aid line because the state aid is based upon um, student enrollment but, but, that calculation. I mean, I, I'm optimistic that we will be back to the same level as we were pre-COVID, but how much higher than that will we be? If we don't go much higher than that, we'll just be at the, we'll still be at the same thing. And if we're, we're going to, I think, I mean, I, we're in a whole, we were in a whole last year, we did two things and we did a furlough day too, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I, I, that, that's a concern. I think we need, and you know, we need to talk about that uh, on this farther on. Um, I agree with the capital budget, either with the county making those recommendations, either planning or maintenance of this building. No use to do it, go both ways. Either we're gonna, we need some direction and I think serious discussion with the county on what's our immediate future with that. Uh, and the only other thing was when we say without full funding, all these things won't happen, some of them will. Well, it, it depends on what the funding is. As right, I understand that. But I mean, when we say we, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things that could, would be affected without Absolutely. this full funding, mm -hmm. but not necessarily all of those things would happen. And maybe not all of them at, the, at 100%, but you know, something we got to go over. The slide and the comments that are made are based on not having full funding. Mm -hmm. Whatever the funding is that we get, we adjust. Yeah, for those things, those things. Okay, that, that's uh, my comments. I think the board needs to take a look at this. Um, we are asking, I think, mm -hmm. from what I understand, not a dollar over maintenance effort. We're asking for about 1.2 million over. Yes, the figure that you see, the 62.2 million, last year as we were meeting with the county, we were given a document which gave some projections for the allocations for our district. And so that 62.2 million was the projection that was on for FY22. And that's why we use that number. So, so that they are familiar with, how they came, that number was proposed last year that if things, revenues they, proceed with it. The county they commissioner gave us that document, correct. Okay. So we're basing that number, that on that. That is correct. Okay. If, you, if I may, um, yes, Mr. Smith, I, I, I agree with the superintendent. This is a, a well-balanced budget. Um, send it over to the commissioners. Let the chips fall where they may. And, and in June, when it comes back to us, we will have to make our changes then. But I, I have no opposition into sending this over to the county commissioners, the operating and the capital budget. Oh, I, I, I want to, as, as one member, we'll have a meeting next. We have two more meetings. We can cancel one of them if we don't need to, but I certainly want to look at this a little farther than detail and, uh, you know, get a consensus of the board of what we're going to set up. Because, you know, once we send something over, it's not in stone. It, you know, we, we, we bargain in good faith. We put this thing, certainly it's your duty to present what is needed for the system. Um, but... We also got to keep in our mind, if this is not done this way, what are we going to do to make changes with recommendations from Dr. Kane? And like I said, we're looking over $2 million of uh, using fund balances, which I can say some, but you know, when we've done it one year and now we're doing it heavier in another year, I think it's a slippery slope we might be going down. And if I may, Mr. Smith, again, we take it over, we send it over, get their recommendations, let them tell us what they're going to pay to us, give to us, and then we have all this discussion in June to go through. We, we did it last June. We had four I, I, work sessions. I, I understand that. So, I, I, mean, I, we, I mean, we can sit here and debate, debate, debate until it comes back to us. That's when the real decisions need to be made in June. Well, my biggest concern are the two things are usually how much fund balance and uh, as big money for the health care is how much we're pulling out of those two. And we won't know, sir, until after they have given the money to us or, or designated how oh, much the money. The fund balance of 650000 is our discretion, and we're putting that in there. But we won't know until they send everything over back to us, and then we'll have to make the hard decisions. We'll make some hard. If they give us more, that's nice, but if they don't, then that 650 is something. I, I'm not disagreeing with you, Mr. Smith. I'm just, again, just reminding everyone that this is not a done deal until June. Any other members? Thank you, Dr. Kane. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you, Kane. Um, we're scheduled.
scheduled for a break, but is everybody all right to keep rolling? Board is staff, board. Yeah, keep rolling. Sure. Can we dismiss our student members? Oh, yes. If you'd like to. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you. Um, for an action item, we, our first thing would be uh, 801 district calendar. We've had a presentation um, with one new uh, calendar proposed after input from the community. Um, do I have a uh, motion? asking for a motion to adopt one of those calendars? Well, it's an action item. We make a motion to do it, and then we can have discussion, and we can decide if we want to move it forward or table it. I would like to make a motion to accept calendar number, uh, scenario number three that was presented to us. Do I have a second? Second. I have a uh, first and a second motion to adopt uh, draft number three, uh, which has been presented to evening, and I think was also put out on our website for public review. We've had discussion on that. That would give us, I think, the major thing that was discussed in April spring break would be from the 15th to the 22nd, which runs from a Friday to a, would be two weekends, plus the Friday before the 16th. Um, any other comments? Ms. Wright. Board members, please respond when I call your name. Mr. Schipanelli? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Yes. Ms. Morset? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. I have five minutes for the motion carries. Thank you. Um, we've had a HR uh, report submitted to us. I make uh, a motion to accept the HR and substitute bus driver report as presented in closed session. Second. I have a first and second. Any discussion? Ms. Wright? Again, please call. answer when I call your name, Mr. Schipanelli? Yes. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Borsett? Yes. Again, five in the affirmative motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is 803 Mattapeak uh, Soffit Purchase. Hi. Hey, once again. <laughs> So I am here this evening to request the approval of a contract with Page Industrial Services to install an aluminum soffit around the perimeter of the building at Mattapeak Elementary School. This contract will be utilizing the Sourcewell Cooperative Purchasing Contract for General Contracting Services. Sourcewell is one of the biggest cooperative purchasing entities in the United States. The exposed soffit structure at Mattapeak Elementary School for anyone who has visited recently is in poor shape. We have severe peeling of the paint around the perimeter and this leaves the material very vulnerable to the weather and to rust. This new soffit will give us some protection from the elements. It's going to protect us from some of the birds that have taken up nesting there underneath the soffit areas as well. And it will greatly improve the aesthetic appearance of the building as we remove that peeling paint and we freshen it up. Sourcewell, we've given you a little bit of information just about uh, how they put out their RFPs. The, these are bid contracts that we're able to show to our auditors and we can align our pricing that we get um, alongside the Sourcewell contracts. This is something that was budgeted for. What we had originally looked at was sandblasting and repainting the existing structure. It was much, much, much more costly. So we think this is a, a good alternative that will give us the same effect and also provide us even a little bit more protection than what we had anticipated. The impact do, uh, dollar amount is 82,468.41 coming from fiscal year 2019. 
I just have a quick question about the firm fixed price. Do you, would, is there provisions to come back to ask for a modification? Do we get mods sometimes on firm fixed? Yes, so we're able to do that by change order. If it's necessary to do either a credit for work that's not done or for any type of changes or unforeseen conditions that they find while they're there, we'd be able to do that as well. Thanks. Sure. And last, um, the, the soffit, so just I'm not familiar with how, how long are they saying it's going to last before it would need? This is probably in the area of 15 to 20 years and it, the structure that will be created will allow us to replace components as opposed to doing large sections at one time. We could do small areas over a course of time as opposed to all of it at one time. Thank you. Yes. So the life, the life of this renovation is pretty much equal to what the new, when the way it was put on because the school's 18 to 20 years old yeah, now. Yeah, 2004, yes. Have any other questions? Make a motion to approve. So moved. Second. second. A motion to second approve. Software replacement Matter Peak Elementary School. Uh, impact dollar amount of $82,468.41 to be funded out of the FY19 capital budget contract building assessment. Any other discussion? Ms. Wright? Again, board members, can I please respond? Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Yes. Mr. Simonelli? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Motion Thank passes. You. Thank you, Ms. Pullen. Thank you. Uh, our next one is Dr. Kane Elite Staffing Contract, Mrs. Bass. Yes, Ms. Bass is going to speak with us about this contract, which we are in fact. Um, thank you, Ms. Bass. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> The originator of this particular contract was requested by Mrs. Smith. Um, we have tried over the year to fill a position for special education and a math position. We did bring this contract before you as a contract for two. They were coming from elite staffing. One was going to fill a math position, but as you know, principal staffed their building. He was not quite the right fit as a math teacher, but he wanted to come as a substitute. I cannot employ a staffing agency to hire a substitute. That would not be in line to what we pay our subs it would be a little bit more. So at this point, we still will look for a math teacher and we will still struggle to do special ed. But I will tell you that Ms. Smith has worked miracles trying to cover and comply with special education law. The children are receiving their services. Correct. I needed her here to say that because I'm not absolutely sure because I don't get out to every building now that we're in pandemic land. But she has done miracles. She is there herself as a substitute teacher some days filling in. So the children are receiving their services. So at this time we need to withdraw that particular petition for you all to approve that contract in order so we can continue to survey agencies if necessary, colleges otherwise, to employ someone in those positions. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Thank you both. Jane on the expenditures report. Good evening once again. Um, we are bringing before you the monthly expenditure report ending the last um, day in February. Is there any questions or detail that I can go over? When I, when I, uh, I mean, a couple of them, which are uh, bigger numbers, like operation of plant, we're at 10, 77, or is that just because we haven't finished up the year? I mean, there could be some expenses coming or is that look just looking pretty good there? The, the operation of plants is, is basically your utilities in there. Mm -hmm. so, for, so, they're, so in February, it's a month behind, so we're paying January bills. So, so we'll, that's going to heat up a little bit next month or something. And there we are, everything, I mean, I know things, you look at this thing, it's not like you divide it by 10 or 12, it's 
it's a seasonal thing, so we're pretty much on track. When will we, at the end, know what kind of surplus we'll have for this year, just a projected, maybe in May or something? We, we can definitely provide some some type of I mean, it, it could be an estimate, and I understand that, but would, you know, know what, what we're, where we are. Yes. Okay. And then the savings, if not used, would normally go into fund balance, and that's mm -hmm. how we get. No, I think that would also, you know, help us with some of our decisions with fund balance, or any one-time cost if we have something, because I, I know it's in capital, but we're hearing a lot about furniture and tables and chairs, and you know, and that's been Need, it's yes. been pushed off for a while. And uh, it doesn't. Okay, thank you. Any other questions by any board members? Thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, policies for first public review. Uh, Now, so we have three policies to bring before you. Uh, first off, so all of these policies have been through policy review several times, and we're bringing them to you for first read. Good evening, board members, Dr. Kane and President Smith. I'm Michelle McNeil, Supervisor of Early Learning, Title I, Title III, and Migrant. So the policy before you is pro promotion and retention. Um, are there any questions in regards to them? What, what's in red is what you're proposing. Um, Okay, um, so what I'm proposing is, uh, if you look at the regulations, is that um, promotion is based on the student satisfactory completing their subjects. We have a difference between elementary and middle and high school um, retention. Mm -hmm. uh, high school retention is based on credits, which is stated in the program of study um, in the high school. Retention at elementary and middle school um, begins is more of a process of informing the parents as of February 1st to let them know the possibility and then the team working together to um, intervene for the benefit of the child and then a conference at the end of the year to make a final determination. This is for uh, first read. Does any other uh, board members have any questions? No. I do. I mean, this we've meant, this is just going out for first read. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. On this distribution to different organizations, I know it's a. You send it out to the people that show interest and not. Did, did anybody ever get back to us? Well, we do have some people, Mrs. Smith, we fly yeah. back that has a vested interest, especially in graduation, because if you look at this, the policy was somewhat outdated. Uh -huh. So because credits have changed significantly since most of us have been in school, and a lot in the last 10 years, so they can be college or career ready. So yes, I would think that, that parents, especially going back to Mrs. Harper's comment about AP, they're very, very interested in promotion and retention. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we need. I mean, we need public input. And, you know, it's, I mean, I, I, I have no problem with this. I don't think any, I don't know what the other board members, but, you know, that people need to do this because, you know, it's, it's their system, not, you know, for, the, for them. Be vested, be involved. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? This Thank has, you. Thank this you. has gone through the executive team, not just the policy committee, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, it has gone through executive, I think, over four weeks. <laughs> Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Kane, board members, executive team. For the record, I'm Jolene Smith, Supervisor of Special Education. I bring before you policy 638 and regulation 638.1, which is student behavior intervention. Policy 638 is an existing policy, but um, there have been some revisions to bring it up to be in line with COMAR. 
prior to um, tonight, we had the policy, but we didn't have a regulation, which is why the regulation is all in red. So the regulation is new. Um, we've always had the regulation language included in our special education handbook, but we felt that it was imperative that it also be reflective of the policy itself. Any questions? This policy isn't just special education. Oh, it is for special Yes. It is special education, but there is a caveat in there that um, in the regulation section that does apply to a general education student in an emergent situation. Okay. I just have one question on, on section six where it talks about the policy review. This says this policy will be reviewed by the responsible office every four years. Etc. and then or as legislative updates are signed. So and before it was just the legislative updates. Did you change that because of something in the regulation or did you f just feel as if it needed to be the, reg more? the regulation itself did not change to, to be reflective of that language, but I do feel that it should be re reviewed and revised regularly. Um, so if legislative changes were to arise, we would need to come back to it sooner. But otherwise, every four years, it should be reviewed just to make sure that it continues to be appropriate. It's always good to bring it before you know, the powers that be so that they're aware of the policies that are out there. We have some policies that, that you know, we're updating now that definitely needed to be updated. And the responsible office is it's, you? Uh, or is that? It's okay, it's us. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's kind yeah. of a, it's a joint yeah. Okay. It's all. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank it has you. gone through executive review and has gone to policy committee. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Kane, board members, executive team. For the record, I'm Matt Evans, supervisor of student services. The policy before you is policy 616 and regulation 648. Oh, that's right, they changed, I'm, I'm sorry. 648 and 648.1, the educational equity policy. Uh, in June of 2019, the State Board of Education granted permission to pu publish in the Code of Maryland Administrative Regu Regulations uh, 13A.01.06 for educational equity. This addition to COMOR requires each school system to develop and adopt an educational equity policy and regulation. Uh, MABE, our Maryland Association of Boards of Education, provided its members a sample policy that aligns with the requirements set in COMOR. Uh, this current proposed uh, QACPS educational equity policy and regulation is modeled directly after that MABE sample policy. I only have one comment, and this is, was from the policy committee uh, meeting we had just recently. Under the regulation um, elements B expectation number two, it still says the word structural, not instructional. Or, or structural, yeah, I thought we had said we so, were gonna instructional and institutional barriers. So um, in my notes, I was asked to provide definitions of structural and institutional barriers to the um, executive team, which I did email that on, but ultimately they, they weren't implemented in here. Okay. Uh, I would put that in there. And again, that word is going to be instructional, correct? Yeah. Instructional. Oh, and it's, institutional. So, uh, so I think you do mean structural, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. I do mean structural. Yes. Okay. In the law. Okay. That's in the so law. B2 could stay as it's proposed okay. as it's written. That's in the Comar. <laughs> okay, it's Comar. Okay, thank you so much for clarifying that. Is it in the, the law you're referring to, the Comar? <laughs> so it says structural and institutional barriers to educational and employment opportunities will be eliminated. So what are those barriers here? So um, when we're looking at, when we're talking about instructional barriers would be policies and procedures that systematically disadvantage certain groups of people. Uh, structural barriers would be obstacles that affect the group disproportionately and perpetuate or maintain disparities. And do we have any of those policies on our books? Currently, not to my knowledge. But 
a, a thorough review needs to happen, and, I, and I've mentioned that before. Uh, some some policies are like your a board attorney calls them small p policies. Right. I can give you a for example, one school was creating an artificial GPA for students to be allowed into AP classes. That's a structural barrier. You mean there were? What do you mean they were creating a? They created a, a GPA set a number yeah. to say if you didn't have this GPA, you couldn't oh, be standard. in an AP. That's right. You couldn't be in an advanced placement class. That's a okay. structural barrier. All right, I got you. Yeah. So, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I apologize. Go ahead. The policy committee, we, have just, we talked about that, and we thought structural meaning building structure. Oh, no. Structures, no. Okay. Meaning, policies, okay. procedures. And that's, and that's why I was like, I thought it was instructional barriers no. rather than, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for Within that clarification. Thanks. I wasn't in. Yeah. Thank you. So on page one of the 648.1 and B, expectations. With me? Yes. Uh, number five on the bottom of the page, it says predictability and disparity will be significantly reduced and ultimately eliminated in all aspects of education, including, and then you go to number two, top of page number two, disproportionate representation, representation of students by race, poverty, gender, et cetera, national origin, um, in discipline. So how does that work? So, for example, it could be uh, students with disabilities, minorities would have, would be receiving uh, office discipline referrals at a higher disproportionate rate um, than what their population represents within a school or in the system. Um, and that could also happen. That, that, that's what's happening now, right? That's that not is what correct. This is, that's what this is intended to remedy? That's correct. Yeah. And then how do you remedy it? Well, it, it, and that's certainly what our our, our equity work is is, is geared to. Um, you know, we currently through the state we have a, um, a disproportionate root cause analysis committee that we're working on, where we have representation from all from all levels of uh, uh, of the schools, and ultimately looking at data and paying attention to it. You know, in the past, it's certainly something that we didn't always do. And when you're looking at it regularly and staring you in the face, and you see that, you know, even, and there's times when we think we're doing well, and when you look at that data and see that we're still suspending our, our um, African-American males at, at, you know, three times the rate of, of our other students, it's an issue. So part is of the- statewide or is that county? I'm sorry. That's county, I'm sorry, and mm -hmm. statewide. But part of that, and across the country, but part of the remedy to that is involving professional development. Professional development to help our, our, our educators and our employees understand how to relate to, how to um, nurture uh, students that fall into these groups. And Mr. Um, Evans did mention African-American males, which is absolutely correct. Most of our teaching staff in Queen Anne's County are white females who may not have you know, a significant amount of experience, certainly not by being employed here, with working with our African-American males. And if we are to understand how to remedy the situations, and let's just go ahead and use discipline, for example, we have to be able to understand mindsets, and we have to be able to understand biases, and we have to understand how to uh, put actions into place to change what the data show us. So in order to change the data, is what I'm hearing, is if there's three people that need, that would commit the same infraction, then one person, based on the color of his or her skin, is going to get a different disciplinary result? Uh, is it but that's what's happening now. But we're trying to remedy that. So what our data show us is that nine to, more times than not, African-American males are suspended and disciplined more harshly in Queen Anne's County than their white counterparts for the same or similar offenses. Okay. And do we know the, and the root cause of that is? We and that's part, that that's part of the work. That's part of the equity work, mm -hmm. trying to find out what are biases that we have that causes us to discipline more harshly African-American males. What are the reasons? Biases. It, it could be biases. That's generally one of them. It could be understanding. It could be mindset. There are a variety of reasons why our data look the way that they look and why our African-American males suffer the consequences that they do. Okay. 
and special education, that's in there as well. And I've, I've heard, you know, different anecdotes about that as well, but, uh, and advanced learning, we're talking AP classes, right? And don't we have Honor. a counselor to, or at least a position, right, to help um, minority students get into the AP classes where they typically wouldn't have fit? I mean, I know it's on an individual basis, but. We have equal opportunity schools that we, that was one of the initiatives that was stopped and I made sure that we continue to do that, which does absolutely work with equity teams at both of the high schools to look at mindset and to look at biases and to do professional development. They talk with um, members of equity teams at other school districts. They talk among themselves definitely they reach out to students to make sure that we are addressing and certainly um, one of our data points is a survey that we do for all of our students and our staff and some of our students that are not typically in AP courses don't even know about them sure and they and, and, so, and have a mindset that they don't belong in those classes yeah, that's and part of yeah and part of that work is to work with our educators to ensure that we are reaching out extending a hand to those students Students so that they know that yes you do belong in these classes and and we also offer support groups so that if they are struggling we certainly don't want them to give up but we want to put some supports in place because they have the potential to do that work and it, and we all know data shows us that and research shows us that they benefit just by being in the class whether they score an A or not earn an A or not just being in the class having a higher level of instruction Learning, sure. benefits them okay and um, all right, so uh, number seven of that paragraph, um, it just, I, I think it needs to have a couple second looks here because it says every school and work site within the school system will foster an environment free of discriminatory acts, of course, you know, of hate, um, violence, no matter what the basis is, um, and certainly disrespect. Um, yeah, disrespect's disrespect. I don't care what, you know, race or whatever is involved, but the word insensitivity there, um, who determines if, and I guess we're talking teachers and students, you know, if, if someone commits an infraction of this policy by being insensitive, um, who determines what's insensitive, what's not, and if they are found to be having been insensitive, what are the repercussions? Are there any... So I think that reprimanded or disciplined. Well, I don't. Or? We don't have a, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, Mr. Evans. But we don't have a um, an infraction that specifically calls out insensitivity. This is Correct. new language from the law, and also recommended to us by Maryland Association of Boards of Education. And that is also why professional development is important, because if we don't understand our biases, we don't understand how we come across to others, and sometimes those ways are insensitive. And, and and that's the bottom line. Yeah, and I know the blueprint calls for uh, it's actually a requirement that the school systems um, uh, produce or or that however you want to call it, equitable learning outcomes, ELO, and um, I'm sure that's where a lot of this stems from. Um, I think on number four, it says achievement of all the students will be raised which is good, all the students, doesn't matter what socioeconomic group you're from, that's one of our, that's our mission here at the board. Um, while narrow, narrowing the gap between the lowest and the highest performing students, um, then we've talked about the achievement gap before too, you know, there's gaps based on race, we actually have a gender gap as well. Uh, girls are outperforming the boys in reading and math, so we need to look at that as well. Um, what I just don't want to see happen, and I know it's the, the latest thing, it's all coming from the state, is that some children are given a higher grade in the upper grades or a, you know, a, a, is reaching standards in the lower grades when they're not, because we're feeling forced to close this gap. So what we've got is we're, we're closing the gap on paper, but we've still got a, a learning gap that nobody can see. So just a concern, and I think it's something we, we need to look at, because if a parent <clears throat> sees her child's report card and it says, hey, you know, he's getting B's or she's getting A's and B's, or 
you know, achieving the standards, but it's really not happening, then it's a potential danger. So, uh, anyway. I, I would, yeah, I would comment that that absolutely is not happening. If it was, we wouldn't have the achievement gap that we have. And this is not a law that says for any teacher to go give a child a grade that they didn't earn. That has not been like my experience here right, in Queen Anne's right. County. This is a new and policy. I don't anticipate that it will be because this is, that is certainly not the intent nor the language of this policy. That That's something read into this that is absolutely not its intent or is, nor is the, the language. Okay. So the policy right. committee went through all of these expectations very thoroughly. Yeah, no, I, I know, I, but I'm going to be expected to and, vote on it. I just want to make sure that... And definitely we want to expect a higher achievement. We want to pray that we can get, you know, the, the gap closed, that we... Every school and work site within the school system system shall foster, not will, shall, because it's what we're all striving to in this in our in our society, in this day and age. So that's why the word shall, not will, is a part of this policy. Can I ask one other question? Since we were talking about the um, blueprint, um, I, I noticed in the blueprint there's a re requirement that or at least there's an opportunity for students, the high school students in, I guess, 10th, 11th, 12th grade to earn a college degree by the time they get out of high school. Um, anybody working on that, Dr. Uh, King? Absolutely, my goodness. I'm sure yeah, yeah. We, that was one of the things that was important to myself and Mr. Paluski. We worked with uh, Chesapeake College for quite a while to ensure that we had a program. It was slow going and then COVID came. But as it stands, our children are able to take a as many courses as their schedule will allow for them to take. Um, but if we could final, if we could finalize the early college academy, mm -hmm. then that would give them certain pathways because our kids tend to take a variety of classes, but they're not earning a degree necessarily. Right. Now some of them do, but we wanted to create pathways, and that work has been has been done largely. Uh, they were having some difficulties with instructors mm -hmm. at Chesapeake College. Uh, we do have some instructors some teachers in Queen Anne's County that uh, teach those courses in our schools. So, but we certainly definitely need more if we're gonna expand that. But our students take great advantage of those courses. Some actually go across um, to Anne Arundel and are enrolled in Anne Arundel Community and a great number at um, Chesapeake. So, yep. All right, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and the one thing I understand is we're not changing our standards as far as discipline or anything, we just want to make sure everybody's treated fairly and equally. Well, we're making sure that we're giving students what they need. You know, right. But I mean, yes. you know, we're not, I, I don't want to, you know, when, if something, if, you know, a, a simple thing, if you're speeding going 55 miles an hour in a, in a 25, there's, there's, there's repercussions, but it should be held equally for everybody. Right. right. And I know. Not, and, and, and if somebody, couldn't read, they shouldn't be driving. But I mean, if there's reasons that there's something, then there can be other things you can take into consideration. But we're not gonna change any levels. I mean, whatever happens should be equal to everybody. So so we have our discipline code, which, which gives the options for different levels of offenses. And I can tell you, again, to continue with the African-American males, and this is not only in Queens County, but state and, and nationally, they're just overly suspended for what's called soft offenses, such as disrespect and disruption, as compared to all other students, uh, you know, within so, the school and the school district. So, and to continue what you're saying, Mr. Evans, is I want to be clear about your definition of equal that there this is not an equal policy this is an equity policy therein there's a difference equal means everybody gets the same thing equity means you get what you need in our situation and we'll go ahead and we'll continue to use the black male scenario here since that's what we started and it's a good one uh, because it's real in our scenario black males are treated differently they need an education equity policy so that they can regain some of that footing that everybody else seems to have but that they do not where where is that lost is it in our school system, is it our, in our, just people, outside the... People, I mean, people, people, yep. So we don't treat people, um, all 
people the same. We don't treat all people with respect. We don't treat all, we don't give all people the same considerations. Uh, white males tend to have greater considerations than black males. And the law says, and I'm so grateful for it, that we have to put some policies in place to account for that. That's why it's equity, not equality. But, but, but I, I, I just would hope the standard for society stays you know, we all are in this together. And, you know. I, I would hope that the standard for society would push for equity because the standard for society says that black males are treated worse than everybody else. That is the reality. I mean, you might not like it, but that's the truth. And that's why we have this policy. If I can make a motion, sir, uh, to... Actually, uh, I had, I'm sorry, I had a question. Sure. I was just waiting. Um, and it's really nothing to do with your guidelines so much, but on the guideline C13, when you talk about actively working towards the workforce to reflect the diversity of the student body, do you know just offhand, because it seems like you guys have a lot of the demographics at hand, um, what is our percentage of male to female students in our district, and what's our male to female teacher ratio, if you know that? I do not know that off the top. Of we're not far. We're not far off. We probably are somewhere about 48, 49 percent male and 51, 50 percent female. So we we are real, students. Yes, yes, ma'am. We are very close. We don't have a big gap. Okay. What about with teachers, though? So what? what the vast majority. Teachers? We can get you the percentage, but the vast majority of our teachers are female. And, and Overwhelmingly. Bennett. Okay. I, I will tell you, across the nation, it's just the go-to career for females. Um, it works well with calendars that you can be home when your child's home. You can go to work when your child. And we're fortunate enough that some schools allow you to bring your child to that school. So inherently, it's been a female occupation. That's okay. not new. So then how would, how to, to, so that we could be successful with these guidelines, how do we think that we could actively work towards um, a 50-50 teacher gender split if, do you know what I'm saying? It's like, if that's what we're reflecting of our students, then you talk of recruitment now. <laughs> so I'm talking your let, yeah, you, 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 you're, right, you're marching down my lane. Um, for years, for absolutely years, it has been very difficult to get any males to look at this. Uh, simply because you cannot really run a household as a 22-year-old male for some of the starting salaries. And within a certain amount of time, they have to then engage in a graduate program. Uh, most of them got school, school loans, so they can't get in a graduate program. So that's just been the problem. Um, they, they tend to go for higher paid jobs. And I'm not saying that people go into education for money, but it's real. The starting salary is a starting salary, and most people want to launch their adult life, and they cannot do it on some of the starting scales that we have throughout the nation. In southern states, people start making $26,000. However, it does reflect the cost of living, but $26,000 doesn't go very far when other things are determining what we have to spend, um, habitat, gasoline, food foodstuffs. So that, that, that's that been a problem. And until we make it more attractive for what they have to do, the hours and the workload that they have to do, it may be very, very difficult to increase the male percentage. It almost needs to start in the high school when they're picking their pathways to start recruiting into the majors. We, we tried that uh, with teaching academies. Mm -hmm. That was one of the pathways that they could complete an AA degree in child something. You know, that it could be your first 18 credits toward education. So you could go to any community college in the state of Maryland and start and, and end up with a completer to transfer, because you cannot teach until you complete a four year degree. So you'd already have your beginning credits in education and then you could go and, you know, you want to be a math major, so it would be secondary ed and math and down the line, or elementary ed. And then, then you could go do your student teaching after that. But then you got to pass. There are teaching exams that you have to pass. And there are many, many people that complete a four-year degree because they're not test savvy, going back to access and equity, that they don't pass tests. A lot of people are really good in school, but they're not really good teachers. 
and one thing too in the teaching profession, there's salary, mm -hmm. there's benefits, and there's the, 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 what you work, a 10 or 12 month employee. And yes, there's pros and cons of each one of them. But when you go in, you know, you got a salary. I think our benefits are adequate to anybody as far as, you know, you're, you're getting 12 month benefits on for, you know, not, not, I mean, teachers are year round, but they're 10 month employees. And for what, you know, then, and that's what, that's, that's like you said, it's a benefit. And that's probably why we have a, a more female population because they're off during the summers and it, when the kids are off at school and that's a, that's a perk, but you know, it's, it's, it's the path you choose. Um, so there's, you know, there's checks and balances to some of this stuff. And it's give and takes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know many teachers that don't have a summer job <laughs> just to carry them over. They need that income. Yeah. At least in the early years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we I have mean, a lot more that are a female-led households, too. I mean, we act as if the, fo the, the male is making as the primary breadwinner, but aren't we, are, as a society, we're getting a lot more of single female Leaders. families They're look different doing the, uh, families look so really I different I was just thinking it's the yeah. guidelines we're kind of setting ourselves up for failure on a few of them if we're if we're not able to attain what we're striving for and these guidelines come from the state the majority i'm right from the kieran plan um can you give me a copy of the may template that you were yes. referring to by the time i find it it'll be hours but it sounds like you already got a handle on its location if you could yes. just pdf we'll it or whatever okay thank you Okay. Thank you. I would as well, you. if you don't mind. So we have these three. Well, oh. Ms. Paul, for public, first, first public review. So may I make a motion, sir, to uh, put out for per first review the policies 632, 638, and 648 with the coordinate, coordinating, correlating regulations. Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Oh. Um, <laughs> We have scheduled. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next Wednesday for our budget work session. Um, and we also have one for March the 17th, which, as we discussed this evening, uh, April the 6th, which is prior to our regular school board meeting on, in April, uh, we have to have a proposed budget to go to the county commissioners. So, and send that. Does anybody else have a? Anything good for the calls? Not I. Motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Ayes have it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.